It's good to be in God's house this morning. Amen? Amen. 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 It's a beautiful day. I know that. Look, you can look around and say, look, a lot of people are traveling and not here this morning. We are here. And we're here not to see or be seen. We're here to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. I enjoyed that testimony, Brother Bobby. Uh, Satan does desire to see this. But I, I, I get reminded when I'm feeling that pressure in my own life that it's only as the wheat was refined that it was good to feed others. And so uh, I'm glad to know that God never leaves us. He never forsakes us. And that uh, during this time when so many people are suffering, so many people are hurting, God is just caring for us. God is blessing us. Even the ones that have passed away. I mean, I know there have been many Christians that have died from the coronavirus. I understand that. But that's still, they were not forgotten. It was not unexpected. God always knows what's going on. So if you have your Bibles with you this morning, with you this morning, let's open up to the book of Haggai, chapter 1. Now, it is the second smallest book of the Old Testament in the English Bible. Uh, Nahum is slightly smaller than in the Hebrew Bible, so it's just a little book, very, very small. You can read all the way through it if you're just an average reader, probably in about six or seven minutes. But it deserves more attention than that. It is uh, the first of the post-exile prophets. Sister Carla, we are finally through with all the idol worship. Yay! Because when they returned back from Babylonian captivity, they have actually been cured of their idol worship. That, that's not an issue that Jesus talks about in the New Testament. It's not really. It, it comes up in different ways in Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, but in, different, in a little different ways. Also, if you didn't pick up one of these, this is uh, Brother Tim, one of our deacons, and I were talking about this. This is one of the handiest things. It's the order of the prophets, the prophets in order, now, not just the minor prophets, all the prophets. Uh, all 16 of the writing prophets in order. Pick one of those up on the way out if you didn't pick one up. It, it's real handy. It actually, uh, then at the bottom, I made a little note about the ones that actually overlap each other. So you'll see at one time, uh, there's like five prophets preaching to Judah and Israel at the same time, and God is moving. And then also back there, don't forget to pick up one of the outlines of the book of Haggai. The main thought is this, complete the work on the temple. That, that's what the book is about. Let me give you a little, little background here. They've just returned from Babylon in captivity. They've been back about 16, 17 years. In 536, which would have been the, the, uh, 15 to 16 years before, because he writes this, we know exactly the date. We know, he tells, he and Zechariah both are preaching the exact same month to the exact same people. Uh, Zechariah is a young preacher. Haggai is evidently in his 80s. He's a, and you say, well, that's, that's all right. People, no, no. Average life spent this time was about 65. He's an ancient man. And he's talking to, he actually asked some other ancient men that were there when he saw, saw the temple that had been rebuilt. So 16 years or so before this, they had laid the foundation stone and the people shouted for joy in the book of Ezra. The book of Ezra, even though it appears way before this in the Bible, Ezra mentions Haggai and, and, and Zechariah, this time frame that they're in, and they shout for joy. Praise God. But then the enemy comes against them. And they start having some friction. So you know what they did? They stood up to the enemy. And, no, they did not. <laughs> they gave in to the enemy. And for 15 or 16 years, nothing happens on the temple. In fact, all the material that had been sent down in Ezra chapter 3 from the king of Persia, uh, actually the uh, Medes and Persians, uh, sent down... Uh, by Cyrus the Great, all this material has actually been, are you ready for this church? Stolen by people that live there. And these were not bad people. When, when, when God said, return back to my holy land, there's about a million of Jews living in Babylon. About 50,000 come home. So these are not bums. These are not, these are not no accounts, but as, a land, as it's laying there, people just start, you know, a beam disappears here, some things disappear there, some things disappear. And now, 15 years later, there's no material left. People have been taking this and building their own paneled houses. And then they start using excuses. And we'll see this in just a minute. And, and they're so spiritual. Don't you love when people are spiritual in church for why they're not going to do what God wants? It's not God's time. 
it's not God's time. Let's don't do this yet. No, it's not God's time. Let's don't move yet. Don't let me. Listen, I know that there's there's God's time. And we must, if we, we can get in front of God. But Haggai says to them, what are you waiting on? This is the time of God. Don't you think a 15-year break is long enough? Don't you think it's time for you to get back to work and do the work of God? So that's what the book is about. Reconstruct or uh, complete the work on the temple. And the key verses where he tells them in chapter 1, verse 8, go up into the mountains. You don't have any wood? Go up in the mountains. Cut down wood. Cut down your own trees. You don't have to be the cedars of Lebanon. To please God. God just wants his house built. And so then there's an outline. So just, just pick up that outline and uh, on your way out if you didn't pick one up on the way in this morning. So Haggai, the, one of the three post-exilic pro, uh, prophets, uh, he's preaching at 520 B.C. Again, we know the exact day that he and Zechariah are preaching. And this old preacher is telling us, teaching us, how easy it is to grow apathetic. How easy it is to start out on fire for God. Have the zeal of God in your heart then to just kind of let it, the fire go out. Just kind of let things go away. Here's our essential question this morning. Are you obedient to what the Word of God says for you to do? What would the Word have spoke to? What, have you been in the Word? Are, are you listening to what the Holy Spirit instructs you to do? Now that's, that's a question. You, I can't answer that. Don't be looking at your wife or your husband. This is a question you have to answer for yourself. Am I being obedient to what the, the Spirit of God is speaking to me? Because I guarantee you, every Christian, every believer has something God wants them to do. And we learn that through the Word and as we're obedient to the Spirit. So are you being that way? If not, then take heart today because neither were these people and yet God pronounces blessing after blessing after blessing upon them. Okay, so read verse 1, then we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Haggai chapter 1, verse 1. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month and the first day of the month came the word of the Lord by Haggai unto the prophet, the prophet unto Zerubbabel. He's going to be mentioned very heavily in the book of Ezra. He's going to be mentioned very heavily in, in, uh, in Zechariah and, uh, and here in Haggai. And, and, and he's, he's, he's a great man of God. He's a, the grandson of King Jehoiachin. So he's got David's blood flowing through him. The son of Shetiel, governor of Judah, and Joshua. Now, there are many remember Joshua is a very common name. That was Jesus' name. We, we use the Greek form of Jesus, Jesus, but uh, but uh, or Jesus, but but they're using Joshua, uh, the son of Jehozadak. He's the high priest, and God. And again, both of these prophets are going to talk to these men personally. How would you like to be sitting and, and God sends an old man to you, an old man? maybe on a cane or on a staff, and he's preaching the word, and God will say, go preach just to these two men. And then, later that same afternoon, here comes Zechariah, this young preacher, and said, God sent me to preach to you. You might start opening up your eyes and saying, what's going on here? So, I just think this is one little sad note before we go to the Lord in prayer. Haggai and Zechariah are the books of the Bible that don't start out with in the year of king so-and-so, king of Israel, king of Judah. These two books start out with the king Darius, or king Darius of Persia. It's, uh, it's, it's very sad. God wanted them to be a great nation with their rebellion against him. That's what we've been looking at through the other nine minor prophets. How they just rebelled against God, they rebelled against God, they rebelled against God until finally the northern kingdom was carried away by Syria and the southern kingdom was carried away by, by Babylon. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you today, and I, 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 I don't know. Sometimes I think that, that, that things are truly great and moving, and yet sometimes I think that how sad days we live in. I ask, Lord God, that you help us to see what the Spirit of God has for us today. By your Word, always by your Word. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. It's by God's Word that we grow. It's by God's word that we uh, become faithful to you. So, Lord, I pray that you would bless today, help us to understand this passage of Scripture, and then help us to apply it to our lives that we'll be better Christians in 2020, that we'll be more like what you want us to be, that we have a seal in our heart, that you would rekindle the flames that, that, that may be dying down in, in our hearts. Father, I pray not only for the believers that are here this morning, but those that are 
that will be listening to this on, on Facebook and YouTube, Lord God, that you would encourage them, lift them up. Also for the ones that don't know Christ the Savior, that maybe today would be the day that they say that eternal yes to Jesus. They can go to bed tonight with nothing between them and the Lord. Everything washed away by the blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for what we're about to receive from your hand. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So, consider your ways. Consider your ways. Let's, let's go ahead and just uh, pull up our first slide here. Okay, now, he calls the people to rebuild the temple. Verse 2. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people. Now, notice he doesn't say, My people. It's very important now. This people. That when God refers to them, whether we're going back to... Uh, the, the major prophets or minor prophets, whenever he says this people, it's kind of like when your mama calls you by your first name. <laughs> yeah, Daniel, come in. You know, it's not sweetie or honey or it's not the little nickname. So this is God saying, this people, pay attention, listen up. The time, the people say, the time has not come. The time that the Lord's house should be built. That they're full of excuses. Excuses they want to sound so spiritual to us. We're, we're waiting on God. Uh, uh, what's God doing? And, and but, but the truth is, and I think it was Benjamin Franklin, in fact, I'm sure that is, that one of my uh, old favorite quotes going back from years ago, Benjamin Franklin said, you show me a man that's good at making excuses, and I'll show you a man that's not good at anything else. That's about the truth. And, and you guys are all thinking of it. Not to get that out of your head because I'm preaching that right now. But you're probably thinking about somebody right now. That's my cousin. That's my son. That's whoever. But if you're good at making excuses, you're not good at making anything else. So that's what they're doing. They're saying this. But look what God says to them. In verse 3 through verse 6. Consider your ways. Then came the word of the Lord by the prophet Haggai, uh, by, of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you? Oh, you need to dwell in your sealed houses? Uh, by the way, you might want to say, where did you get all that lumber at? Where did you guys come up with the fine lumber for Lebanon? And this house lie waste? Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. That's a good message. Yes. That's a good message. I don't care what day of the year it is. Consider your ways. Be thinking about what's going on in your life. Where's your standing with God? What's your walk with God like? Where's your uh, private time with the Lord? What, what is your, what's God's ways to you? And he gives us some things to think about. You have so much and bring in little. I found this interesting. I, I, I like the internet on some things that you can just look stuff up very quickly. Do you know that the government keeps up with how many hours each household works uh, with the average... People work have worked more in the last 30 years households than any other time in our nation's history. I, I, maybe because so many women are also working and men are working, uh, women both are working so many extra hours, but but this simply sounds like us. You have so much and bring and live. You know people like that? Seem like they work and they work and they work and they take another job and another job and yet their credit card debt keeps going up and this keeps happening and this keeps happening everything keeps breaking down. You want to know why? They're not following God. It's part of them. And part of it is because, just listen to me, some practical thing. Maybe I'm still in the mode from last night when I was doing the marital counseling with a couple getting ready to get married. And I'm going to say this. Don't keep running up your debt. Don't just keep saying, I've got to have this. I've got to have that. The heart of man, I want you to know, is never satisfied. So, so you so much and you bring in little. You eat, but you have not enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe you. There's, but there's an emptiness. All these things are still leaving you empty inside. But there's none more. And I know this speaks to the United States of America in 2020. And he earneth wages. He that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. <laughs> you ever feel like that? You know how people say, oh, money speaks. You know what mine usually says? Goodbye. <laughs> you know. So, so, the, so, the, so you're talking about, so he's saying this. Why is this happening? God, God's going to give them a reason. Why is this happening? Because the house of God is lying waste. God wants us to understand that he says, I will meet all your needs. Christ will meet all your needs. This is from the book of Philippians chapter 4. Christ will meet all your needs according to his riches and glory. Not, not just a little bit, but according to his riches. According to his blessings. 
But it does not say that it will meet all your greeds. It will meet all your needs according to the riches and glory. But, but people are always saying, I, 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 you need to consider your ways. What's going on here? Why does it seem like I don't have enough? Why is there always this emptiness in my life? Well, I wrote down just a few little questions in case you're not considering what I want you to consider this morning. And if you were preaching, you could do what you want to consider, okay? But since I'm preaching this morning, uh, why are you not faithful to the house of God? I don't have enough time. I'll let you know you have the same amount of time that everybody else in the world has. You know. Why are you not uh, giving your tithes and offerings? Well, the economy is bad. Well, the economy is always bad. You know, the economy is always bad. I mean, there's always uh, this gloom or that gloom or this destruction or that destruction, something going on. So, and here, here's what somebody told me. Actually, somebody actually told me this. My wife and I just made $35,000 a year, and I, I did, did feel sorry for us because that's not a very good salary. And, I, and, and so we can't pay our tithes. And I said, let me tell you something. If you can't pay your tithes on $35,000, you certainly won't pay them when you make $135,000. You won't. Uh, you, you won't pay them. You won't pay them if you make seventy thousand. You won't pay. You won't make. You won't. You pay your tithes because what God says to do with the first fruits that you receive. But but you can always make excuses. There's always excuses. There's always a reason why you can't do this or you can't do that. What about your prayer life or going out witnessing or good works? Oh, I, I've got too many important things to do. You're too important to talk to God. You're too important to take time to pray to seek the face of God. You're too important to to, to want to uh, uh, go out and witness or, or want to testify of what God's doing in your life. So consider your ways. Next thing, let's just go ahead and bring up the rest of this first slide here. Next thing is the word is the answer. Here's where the answer is: Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house. Let me read that again. Go up. Get off your tail. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house. Now, the, the material is gone, so God says, get up. And then what it says is, I and I will take pleasure in it. I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Now, we'll see more about that at the end of the message when, when it talks about the glory of the second temple. But, I love this part. Because just because, listen to me, just because you messed up, you have quit working for 15 years. You, you, you're not doing what God wants you to do in your life. You, your heart has been growing cold. The fire has gone out. Let me tell you what. God doesn't need the panel from Lebanon. God doesn't need to have Cyrus's gold or silver. God wants you. The greatest ability in the world is availability. God wants you. So he says this. What encouragement this is. If we will receive his whip, we, we, we put our money in the bag with holes in it. Let me, let me go on and read over here in, in verse 10. He says, uh, well, let me just keep reading. Uh, but you look for much, and, and Lord came to little. And you brought it home, and I, and I blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts, because mine house that is laid, that is waste. And you run every man into his own house. You got plenty of time to work on your house, but not on my house. Therefore, the heaven over you is saved from dew. They, they, they depend on the dew and the rain. They're an agricultural society. The earth is saved from her fruit. I call, God said, I called for this. God said, I did this. I called for a drought upon the land, upon the mountains, upon the corn, upon the new wine, upon the oil, upon uh, that which the ground bringeth forth, upon uh, men, upon cattle, upon all the labor of the hands. So God said, I did this. Why? Because you're not being faithful to me. But go back to verse 8. I will take pleasure in you. It's not too late what I'm trying to tell you. You may have said, well, I stole from God. I, I took the wood and built my own house. I haven't been doing anything for God. I haven't been faithful to God and not teaching my children about God. All this, whatever it is that God's speaking to you about, I don't know what the Holy Spirit's speaking to you about. But you say, I haven't been doing this. Here's the good news. If you do, God says, I will bless you. Let me take you to one of my favorite verses. And all you probably know this verse by heart. If we confess our sins, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He didn't say He's unfaithful. He has a reason to forgive us because His Son died for us on Calvary. 
He is faithful and just. He's justified to forgive because Jesus died on Calvary. So he's saying here, it's not too late if you'll just go to the mountains and bring common wood down from the mountains. Take your saws and axes. Go to the mountains. I will bless the work of your hands. Church, that should encourage every one of us. That should make all of us have a thrill in our heart to say, it's not hopeless. I have wasted my time. I have uh, taken the wood from God's house. I have not been faithful. Whatever it is. But see, you can do this. Because verse 8 is that encouraging verse that says, go up to the mountains. That's the key verse that understand the whole book. Go up to the mountains. Bring back the wood. God's going to pour out His anointing upon you. God's going to give you skill with your hands and labor with your and understanding with your mind. So, verse 12, are you ready for this? When Debbie was typing the outline for, for y'all to read, you know what she put? They were disobedient. Because guess what we've been in for the last nine <laughs> books, right, Carla? They were disobedient. But guess what happens here? The people were obedient. He's a prophet that preaches in less, about less than 25 days later. They're doing what he said to do. Jeremiah preached for over 40 years and got one convert. And as soon as Jeremiah died, he backslid. Uh, Isaiah preached and, and very little movement. The people would not, for the most part, occasionally have a king that would listen. But for the most part of Isaiah's over 50 years of ministry, most people did not listen. How much they would have loved to preach the message. And the people Church, be encouraged today. You can be obedient. Verse 12. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shetiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. This is, this is mind-blowing. They were obedient to God. God is moving. And they're listening. You may think we'll never have another revival. We'll never have the Holy Ghost pour out His anointing on Southern West Virginia like He did in, in, in the year 1950, 1979. We'll never have uh, another one of these. But I'll tell you what, we can because God has not changed. Somebody say amen. Amen. My goodness, God has not changed. God is still on the throne. And they obeyed the voice of their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God sent them, had sent them. And the people did fear before the Lord. Then spake Haggai, the Lord's messenger, in, in, in the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. Wow, that's the key to success, isn't it? That's where the answer is. I am with you, saith the Lord. Guess what? In the New Testament, you don't have to wonder about it. If you know Christ as Savior, He said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. He said, in the book of Matthew, if you'll go out and witness, I'll go with you to the end of the world. I'll go with you forever to the end of the age, to, every, to the cul culmination of it all. This is God talking here. I am with you, saith the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shetel, the governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest, and the spirit, I love this, like it's kept saying, and, and, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came, all right, are you ready for this? And did work. Wow. You don't know how that makes this old Republican feel. I'm just kidding now, okay? But I just love, I love people to work. I just think it's God made, God did not make Adam and Eve to lay like little lounge lizards or whatever. He made Adam and Eve to tend the garden. And when we get to heaven, by the way, when we spend eternity with God, we won't just be floating around like disembodied spirits. We'll have a real body you can touch. We'll be able to hug each other, grasp each other, love, know each other. We'll have that. But there'll be work to do. There'll be things for us to accomplish. And yet, and yet we'll always be worshiping and never seeing all the facets of God. We'll be there 10 billion years, 10 trillion years, whatever numbers come after that. Guess what? We'll be there and we'll never see. Because we say it's a, the endless glory of God. It really is. It's not going to end and say, oh, well, that's it. Okay, well, okay everything's done. We're being here for <coughs> 25 trillion years. No, 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 no. We will always be saying, look at that. I never saw that. That's God moving. That's God in our lives. But they're working in the house of the Lord and host their God in the fourth and twentieth day of the sixth month in the second year of Darius the king. So the first one was August the 29th when he starts preaching, verse 1. This is September the 21st, same year. 
Less than 25 days later, they're working. In four years, they'll have it all finished. In four years, there will be a temple for them to worship in. Hallelujah. What God is moving. God is moving. God is moving. Hallelujah. By the way, if you want to do it, if you like math, and I do, I like fifth grade math. The temple was destroyed in 586 B.C. You go four years from 520, come in one of your masters, what's that take you to? 516, okay, God, come on. Now. This is, yeah, we've been out of school. Thank you. One of my great school kids after this. Thank you. Well, listen, guys. So, and if you take 516, and you subtract that from 586, how many years do you have? 70, that's exactly right. And God said it'd all be completed. God, God knows exactly what. He knew that the people would lose their fire. Look, when you're disobedient to God, you didn't catch it. Oh, no, oh, no. I didn't know Brother Otis was going to do that. God knows already that we're not always faithful. God knows already that we're going to fail Him. He's not taking us. God's not going to be taken by surprise by our failures. He remembers that we are but dust. He remembers what we're made of. And yet He loved us so much that He sent His Son to die on the cross of Calvary for our sins. Hallelujah. So, so, so they're, they're doing it. They're, they're doing the work. They're moving. God is blessing. God is with them. He stirred them up. The Word is stirring them. God is moving around and what did Jesus say? Seek ye first the kingdom of God. <laughs> and all these things, what? All these other things that you're all worried about. you know, and, and what he's talking about, he just had said, can you worry and add uh, a foot to your stature? Can you worry and, 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 and make uh, uh, your clothing there? Can you worry and bring food? No, 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 no. But he said, if you'll put God first, God takes care of this. God will do the blessing. Jesus also said this, and I wrote this down. He that will lose his life shall save it. But he that wants to hold back his life, save his life, shall lose it. So, all right, so that's the first part. It's the first prophecy, so we finish the first of these four prophecies. The next one is very short, and we're going to look at that before we close this morning, verse 1 through 9, okay? This is the second part. He's talking to Zerubbabel. I call to Zerubbabel. He's preaching not to this one man, but he's preaching also, since he's representing the nation, he's preaching to all the people, okay? In the seventh month, by the way, I'm going to go ahead and give you this. is October the 17th, 520 B.C., same year, just a couple of months later, okay? A couple of months from August when he first started, less than them, barely over a month from when they started the work. So, so in the seventh month, in the first and 20, a day of the month, came the word of the Lord by the prophet Haggai, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shetiel, the governor of, of Judah, and Joshua, the son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest, and to the resident of the people, saying, Now, preaching to everybody, but Zerubbabel is his first target, okay? Because he knows Zerubbabel has a, a good heart. He knows Zerubbabel has a good heart, okay? But if you're looking up at the outline, you can see Zerubbabel means, what does it mean? Somebody read it to me. Born in Babylon. Born in Babylon. He was born in Babylon. He is, he is the grandson of Jehoiachin. By the way, even though uh, Jehoiachin's uncle becomes the last king of Israel, uh, after this, Zedekiah, uh, Ezekiel never refers to him as king. He always refers everything to Jehoiachin, the king of Israel. Like, Ezekiel never credits Zedekiah with anything. And by the way, Jehoiachin does make his heart right with God, even while he's in Babylon, and God finally sets him free. That's something that's how God does. But anyhow, that's, that's, that's part, a little bit more maybe for next week when we talk about the city. But, so, born in Babylon, you know, I think he represents all the sons of Babylon, all the sons of Babel, all the daughters of Babel. He represents every one of us here today. We were all born in Babel. Whether you're talking about the Babel or the book of Genesis, where they said, said we'll be like God and we'll build a, a, a tower to God, or whether you're talking about Babylon of the prophets' days, the, the Babylon of Nebuchadnezzar, or whether you go to the book of Revelation and you see Babylon, 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 the book of Revelation, from Genesis to Revelation, there's always these two rivers that are flowing. One is of apostasy, and one is of holiness. One of apostasy, one of holiness. And we were all born of apostasy. We were all born in sin. But guess what? God redeems us. 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 We we're born in Babel, but we don't have to live in Babel. We're born in Babel. We can shake Babel from us and, co and, and let our hearts be made right with God. So, now we come to the... By the way, a little side note here. Uh, October the 17th, 520 B.C., that is the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. 
Remember, Jesus stood up on the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. That's what Brother Jeremy preached on that a few weeks ago on Friday night. Uh, this is the when they bring the harvest in. And so this is a very, it's also the day, it's also the day that Solomon dedicated the first temple. So this is a special day to them. And so this day, the Holy Ghost stirs up uh, Haggai and he goes and preaches to Zerubbabel. That's a sad question here. Who is left among you that saw this house in her first floor? Haggai was to raise his hand. He was one of them. So this is, this is before that's completed. So this is 520. So Haggai, if he saw the temple of his glory in 586, he's even remember, he'd be 10, 12 years old. So he, even, he's already an old man. Who saw the houses for? And how do you see it now? You see the house is uh, outlined, but it's not being completed yet. Is it not in your eyes in comparison as, as nothing? How, how sad it is to ask these questions. But don't dwell on the past. He was only a child when he was carried away in 586 B.C. Now, 66 years later, he said, don't get caught up in the past. Quit making excuses. Follow God. Cast our vision for the future. Church, it's so easy for you. Now listen to me. Listen, listen. This may seem like a little minor point here in verse 3. But he, Haggai has this for a reason. Look at the oh, look at those of you that can remember the glory of Solomon's temple. Look at what we're building now. It seems like nothing does it in comparison. But wait till we get over to verse 7 and verse 9. Okay, listen. In fact, you, I, you can go ahead and read those. Just don't leave the book with me. Okay, you can go ahead and read those while I'm preaching right now. That's okay. Listen. But he said, don't get caught up in the past. So I made some little notes here. Don't get caught up in the past. Don't weigh out your options. Don't examine your alternatives. Don't negotiate the terms. And don't quit. Let me go through those again. Don't weigh out your options. Well, I should follow God, but it's Thursday. I don't know if I'll follow God. Thursday or not. Uh, uh, don't examine the alternatives. What else will be done? Don't negotiate. With God, I'll, I'll, I'll promise God I'll follow you if. Well, that's a real way to talk to the God that spoke the whole world into existence. If you can believe Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, the rest of it's easy. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. God spoke it all into existence. God is God, and we are not. There's nothing without God. God stepped into nothing. In, 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 the, uh, in, in the early church, they called it the, the ex nihilo factor. He stepped into nothing because there was nothing that spoke the world into existence. My goodness. So, don't examine the alternatives. Don't negotiate the terms. And don't quit. Just keep being faithful to God. Yes, you'll not be knocked down. Yes, you'll fall down. Yes, you'll fail God in many ways. But don't quit. Be strong. Trust God. Let me just take you for a little Bible study. Keep your place here. I'm going to take you to the to the book of Ezra. And you can turn there with me if you want to, but I'm going to be going pretty fast. I may be done there before you get there. But to the book of Ezra. And here's what Ezra has to say. Chapter 5. Then the prophets, Haggai the prophet, and Zechariah, the son of Edu, prophesied unto the Jews that were in Jews, uh, uh, Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the of God of Israel, even unto them. Then rose up Zerubbabel, the son of Shechiel, uh, Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, and began to build the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem. And with them were the prophets of God helping them. So these, the, he's there preaching. And at that time, boo, if we're playing a movie, this is where the Darth Vader music starts. <laughs> Okay. All right. At that time came Tanai. Tanai. What a cool name. No, it's not. I'm being facetious. Okay. Tanai, governor of this side of the river. And then he's got a couple of companions with him that I wouldn't even try to pronounce their names anyhow. So, and they said, Who commanded you to build this house and to make up this wall? Well, they weren't making up the wall. It's a lie. Satan always lies on us, right? He is the accuser of the brethren. So they say, go check with the king, blah, 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 blah. They keep going on. And chapter 5 ends. Chapter 6, there's the king looks at the old records from, from, uh, from Cyrus and all this stuff. And here's what I love. Are you ready for this? Are you ready? This right here make a bad shout. Are you, are you ready? Now, get ready now. Get ready. Bring up in there because we're going to get ready. Just wave our hanky and praise God. All right, let's <laughs> Now, therefore, a chapter and a half later. Now, therefore, tonight... The governor beyond the river and his friends were young, were called by Darius the king. And here's what Darius says, verse 7 of chapter 6 of Israel. Let the work of the house of God alone. 
Let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews build the house of God in his place. Moreover, I make a decree that ye shall do to the elders of, Jew, of the Jews for this building the house of God. This is what you shall do for them. That the king's goods, even the tribute, the taxes beyond the river, he's telling tonight who's the governor of all that's beyond the river, take all the silver, all the gold, all the tax money, forthwith, and expenses be given to these men that they may not be in. What does God do? Hallelujah. The devil tries to hold us back and God just throws it right back in his face. If we do what? Get our saws and our axes and go to the mountain and do something for God. Amen. So I just think that's great. Hallelujah. They go argue against him, try to bring them down. And what does God do? God speaks to this pagan king, Darius the Great, and says, I tell you what's done. Let's help them along. Let's give them more gold and more silver and more wood and more blessing. Let's just pour out up on top of them all the blessing. Because that's what God does. I'm not telling you if you follow God, you'll have everything you ever want in life. But I promise you, if you'll give God your heart, God will be in your heart. God will walk with you no matter how dark. And you'll still have dark days. You'll just still be, there'll still be the, uh, the dark nights of the soul that come. But you have a lot of God in you. Do you, do you see this? Right, so, so, so he's saying to them, let's go back to, to Haggai chapter 3 now, okay? So here's, here's what God is saying to them. Be strong. Just be strong, my brother. Be strong. Put God first. Trust God's promises. Verse 4. Yet now, be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord. Be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord. And be strong, O Joshua, the son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest. Be strong, all ye people of the land, saith the Lord. And work, for I am with you. I am with you. I am with you. I will never leave you, saith the Lord of hosts. Trust God's word according to the word that I covered with you when you came out of Egypt. I have not changed in all these years, so my spirit remaineth among you. Fear ye not. And I underline that in my Bible. My spirit remaineth is among you. But let me tell you what. I'm glad I'm a New Testament saint because now the Holy Ghost lives in me. And he'll convict me of my sin. Brother Dave, he'll cause us to live right. He'll, he'll cause us to see his plans and not our plans. He'll cause us to, to want to cast our vision for his future, not our future. Holy Ghost lives inside of us. Be strong. Romans chapter 8. I'm not going to take you there. But if you don't mind reading this later, read these five verses. Romans chapter 8, verse 28 through verse 32. It will blow your socks off because it sounds like you're reading the rest of the sentence here in Haggai. It's like you, you just finished reading Haggai chapter 5, verse uh, chapter 2, verse 5, and then you start reading Romans chapter 8, verse 28 through verse 32. And you say, wow, what kind of God do we serve? What kind of God do we serve? Well, why don't I just do it for you? I can tell y'all looking that way, so I might as well do it for you, okay? <laughs> Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that who are called according to His purpose. For whom He did foreknow, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. He says, if I know you, I want you to be like my Son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, whom he called, he also justified, whom he justified, he also glorified. What shall we then say to these things? Come on, you know this. If God be for us, who can be against us? I had one little kid that misquoted that one time. If God be for us, what's it matter who's against us? Go, That's actually pretty good. That's pretty good right there. It doesn't matter who's against us. It doesn't matter. He spared not his own. I told you we're going to go through verse 32. He spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him freely give us all things? Hallelujah. You can still go back and meditate. Just like he's finished in verse 5. Like, like, like Paul's finished in verse 5 for Haggai here. And then uh, our last one. Our last few verses here this morning. Our last few verses here this morning. Okay, now. So we trust God, we, we put all of our faith in God, but God will bring us peace. Verse 6 through verse 9. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, Yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. He's letting them know this is not happening in their day. Now he, he's doing what the other minor prophets have done. Now he's looking to the future. He's looking to Jesus' first coming, and he's also looking to Jesus' second coming. 
That, see, the, they did not see it that way. They did not see it as they looked from one mountaintop to the next mountaintop that there was the church age between this. But it says, I will shake the heavens and the earth. And I will shake all nations, and the desire of nations shall come. Who is the desire of all nations? Got an answer for that? Jesus. Jesus. It's always Jesus. Isn't it? And I will fill his house, his house, this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. <coughs> so, these are the only two verses from Haggai that's quoted in the New Testament, it's quoted in the book of uh, Hebrews, chapter 12, when, when the writer of Hebrews is saying, Jesus is coming, and he's talking about the second coming. He takes these two verses here, basically the same thing that he says in, in verse. Uh, chapter 2, verse 21, verse 22. Same things again. But he quotes these verses here that God's going to shake the heavens and the earth again like a fig tree. God's going to shake the heavens and the earth. God is going to move. God is in charge. And he's going to send the desire of the nations. He's going to send his own son. Hallelujah. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, I don't know why this is here, but I'm going to tell you it's true. The silver is God's and the gold is God's. All of it's God's. When the children of Israel came out of the land of Egypt, and Moses said, We need to build a tabernacle. There was a forerunner to the temple that they're building. Okay? Forerunner to Solomon's temple. There was a tabernacle. And they brought so much gold and silver. Every preacher in the world would love to have this problem. And Moses said, Tell them to quit, bro. We can't stand any more money. And if one of them television preachers did that, I'd probably send him a dollar. That's what I would say. If one of them had just come up and said, We got more money. Please don't send this ministry anymore. We got more money than we can take to God. And done. No. You know, I might say, well, let's just put them over top. I'll send them one more dollar. But anyhow, so, uh, but what, what happened? Because they, the silver belonged to go, God, and the gold belonged to God. And now when they built Solomon's temple, when David and Solomon did that, what? The gold was God's and the silver was God's. It's all God's. And not, now he wants them to know the silver is, 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 and the gold is not Cyrus. It's just not there. It's just, it's God's. It's God's. God's the one that's in control. That, that's a little, little verse he throws in. The glory of this latter house, the house they're building right now, shall be greater than the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. Do you know why that he says this? When Solomon finished building the temple, and on the Feast of Days, uh, Feast of Tabernacles, when they dedicated the temple, the Bible says that the Shekinah glory came down so great in Solomon's temple that the priest fell on the, on the ground, they couldn't even stand up, and the light shined out from it at noonday. I mean, we're talking a mere a miraculous thing. Light just shining out, booming out into the daylight, uh, shining out. God's glory was there. And he says, this house, this little building we're building, is going to have more glory than that. And it did. Because there was this little eight-day-old baby named Jesus that they take up to the temple. <laughs> This temple that they're building. I know that it's been modified and built onto by Herod, but they take them up. Every time that Jesus went to the temple, there was more glory there than Solomon's temple ever hoped to have. I'll prove it to you. First John, I mean the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 14. It says, Jesus came into the world and dwelt among us. In fact, pretty, pretty, pretty cool, pretty cool words. Tabernacles are kind of drawing back to this. And we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. This temple that they're building has nothing in comparison to the temple. I mean, the temple that Solomon built has nothing in comparison to the temple they're building because God Himself, God in the flesh, Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, will walk in that temple. He will do miracles there. He will work His works there. God is blessing there. Oh my goodness, what a day! One day. And of course he's coming again. And that's the point here. God's coming. I want to read you one little quote from another old preacher that I love. If you ever get a chance to uh, listen or, or not listen to read stuff from Vance Havner, please do. He said this, faith sees the invisible, faith chooses the imperishable, and faith does the impossible. That's what I'm challenging you to do today is to keep going for God. Go to the mountains. Bring down the wood. Let God be a blessing to you. Let's read our conclusion this morning. Okay. Don't look back. Don't weigh yourself down with options and alternatives. Just believe and obey God. Be faithful to God and you will succeed. I'm not talking about financial success. I'm not. I, I will tell you this that he's never seen a seed out begging for bread or, or the righteous forsaken. I promise you will meet all your needs. But I'm not talking about financial success. I'm talking about true success. Not about the size of house you live in. It's about the home of God being in your heart. It's about being satisfied with God. God is faithful. He's the only one that can purify our sins. 
Our glorious Messiah is coming again. Let's stand together. I, Sister Carla, if you would come back to the piano this morning. If you don't know Christ the Savior, what a day to be saved so the glory of God can enter into your heart. Jesus Christ Himself will enter into your heart and you can know the power of God today. Hallelujah. Time is short. Eternity is long. Jesus is coming. Let's we'll stand together this morning. your book, Haggai. And everybody else will be saying, who's Haggai? Who's that dude here? I don't know who he is, you know. You say, man, he's one of the prophets of God. He's one of the, one of the big 16. He's a pro he ain't a minor prophet. He, he preached and in 20 days accomplished what Jeremiah couldn't in 40 years. He's a man of God. That's what he is. Wouldn't that be cool if Jesus comes and gets us before this week is over? Look up, church, our redemption. Lost nine. This time we're going to end our, our broadcast and Thank you for being with us today. Pray that God is speaking to you. Let's we'll pray and search in the face of God. Are you willing to take your action?